This is the Turkish Lira and compared to the US dollar it was basically on fire for most of 2022. But as you can see in this chart it was already falling relentlessly for a long time before that and then started falling even faster in 2022. And it was at this point that many news programs would start reporting like this. This crisis has really hit the Turkish middle class and the poor, of course, and that's devastating. And what does the government say to this kind of reaction? Turkey's, uh, it shows no single sign uh, to, to, uh, that is indicating an improvement in, in, in stabilizing the shaking economy. The government has announced in the contrary it will cut interest rates from 14% to 13%, which by the way is the opposite of what you usually do when inflation is high. But to that, Erdogan usually responded with something like this. Onların dolarları varsa bizim Allah'ımız var. So while the lira kept crashing rather than increasing the interest rate, Erdogan's government just kept lowering interest rates from 18% in mid-2021 all the way down to 10.5% in October 2022. And then the Turkish lira actually stabilized. However, just before the lira stabilized, other strange things started to happen. While Erdogan was for the longest time one of Israel's biggest critics, saying stuff like this. Now they're reopening their embassy in Tel Aviv. And while Turkey's government used to condemn the United Arab Emirates for allegedly funding a coup against him in 2016, now Erdogan seems keen to talk about friendship and brotherhood with them again. Finally, just after the lira stabilized at the World Cup in Qatar, Mr. Erdogan for the first time ever shook hands with El Sisi, a man who he did not even recognize as the legitimate president of Egypt and had previously referred to as a murderer. So what happened? Did Turkey actually save its economy by lowering interest rates or did Erdogan see no other way out of the crisis than to basically sell his country's economy to his former enemies? Well, to answer that question, we first need to investigate the following. Why was the lira collapsing in the first place? But before answering that question, let me give you some insight into how I recently sped up my research process by using Wondershare's PDF Element, the sponsor of this video. First, for my Dalio response video, I used PDF's Element's Optical Character Recognition, or OCR, function extensively. This function allowed me to find key statements in Dalio's latest book much more quickly. All I needed to do was take some pictures of chapters in the book. PDF Elements OCR function then recognized the text and transformed it to a searchable PDF file. Second, for this video I used some German language articles as sources. Here, instead of copy-pasting the text to an internet solution, I simply used PDF Elements new translation function to get an English text. Last and certainly not least, I often need raw data for the graphs that I use in my videos. And sadly, a lot of this data is only available in clunky PDF file tables. With PDF Elements Extract Data from Table feature, I now am able to automatically export this type of data to an Excel file. So if these type of features sound useful in an affordable and fast package, check out the link in the description of this video. So let's now get back to talking about why the lira was collapsing in the first place. To answer questions about international finance, I always like to go back to good old supply and demand. According to economic theory, there are two main reasons for people to supply or demand a currency. The first is financial gain and the second is trade. Let's talk about financial gain first with an example. Let's say that one country randomly starts increasing its interest rates while others do not. This will make that country's currency much more attractive compared to other currencies and this will increase the demand for it. And thus, it will increase its price. This could explain why the dollar has been so strong compared to most other currencies. After all, the Fed started raising interest rates more quickly and more aggressively than most other central banks. And if we apply this concept to Turkey, it implies that the reason its currency kept collapsing was that its interest rates were simply too low. Indeed, this is why most economists were telling Erdogan to raise interest rates. However, the problem with this explanation is that in the past, Turkey actually had really high interest rates 
for a long time and their currency was still falling. Some economists even argue that it were precisely these high interest rates that made the lira so weak. You see, having a high interest rate made borrowing in lira really unattractive. And this means that more and more Turks started borrowing in foreign currencies with low interest rates such as dollars and euros. Now, listening to economic wisdom, the Turks recognized that this was potentially really dangerous. After all, if most of its citizens were borrowing in dollars and the lira dropped, this would drastically increase their debts. For example, let's say that Turkish companies had borrowed 1 billion US dollars when these were worth 1 billion liras. This seemed like a good idea at the time since dollar loans required a much lower interest rate than lira loans. However, if the lira then loses half of its value, this means that the debt of Turkish companies is now twice as much in lira terms. Now this could potentially mean that Turkish companies will get out of business because they cannot repay their increased debt. So what the Turkish government did in response was to dollarize its economy. In practice, this means that it made it easier for citizens to open foreign currency bank accounts and this allowed many Turks to hold dollars at their local banks. To see how this might help, let's go back to our previous example in a dollarized economy. Let's now say that Turkish companies also held most of their savings in dollar accounts at their local banks. If the Turkish lira now halves in value, it would still mean that the debt of Turkish companies would be twice as difficult to repay. However, because most company savings were now also in dollars, the lira value of their savings also doubled. And as you can see, this means that Turkish companies see the lira value of their debts increase, but also the lira values of their savings. Meaning that far fewer companies are likely to get into trouble in such a dollarized economy. However, on a macro level, this strategy produced an unwanted side effect. You see, every time the lira would go down in value, Turks now had easy access to a bank account with dollars. This allowed them to quickly sell liras for dollars to protect their savings. Ironically, this would then actually make the lira fall further. Of course, this made the currency much more unstable and given that one function of money is to be a stable store of value, it also made the lira much less attractive and therefore depreciate. Now, in response, the Turkish government introduced its so-called liraization strategy around the end of 2021. This strategy included making foreign currency accounts less attractive for Turkish banks to offer and simultaneously making lira deposits more attractive for Turks to own by protecting them from these wild currency swings. And while adoption was slow at first, these protected lira deposits were actually becoming wildly popular already around November this year. And so this could actually explain why the lira stabilized around this time. However, at the same time, Turkey saw the return of its massive trade problem. This problem is related to the second key factor that drives the rise and fall of currencies, trade. As you can see here, Turkey historically imported way more than it exported. And while Turkey's trade deficit was finally improving before 2020, it got way worse during COVID when all tourists were shut out of the country. And then, crucially, at the start of 2022, energy prices shot up after Ukraine was invaded. And as you can see in this graph, this made Turkey's trade deficit much, much worse. So from this perspective, it is not surprising that the lira just kept falling throughout 2022. After all, on average, liras needed to be sold on the foreign exchange market to pay for these imports. After all, gas and oil need to be paid for in dollars. So when these prices skyrocketed, more and more Turkish liras were offered on the foreign exchange markets just so that Turks could literally keep the lights on. Now, this meant that while Erdogan's protected bank account scheme was helping on the financial side, it likely wasn't enough to completely stabilize the lira. And so Turkish voters were getting really, really unhappy with the tumbling lira and the resulting sky-high inflation. Hoping to be re-elected in June next year, Erdogan simply had to do something. But he couldn't immediately increase Turkey's exports or reduce its reliance on energy imports. So his solution had to be financial, and since he had already done his best convincing Turks to hold lira, 
it seemed like he had no other option than to raise interest rates to convince foreign investors to buy Liras. Or he could come up with yet another highly unorthodox solution that would surprise economists everywhere. So the only option he had left was to turn to his regional rivals, which were energy exporters and therefore now swimming in dollars. And yeah, in some cases this required a bit of political acrobatics from Mr. Erdogan. So sure, Erdogan said the following about Israel in 2014. Israel is a terror state. But now diplomatic relations are restored and Israel might start helping Turkey to become energy independent, reducing its trade deficit. What's more, while it was delivering drones to Ukraine and while its NATO allies were greatly reducing their exports to Russia, Turkey's trade with Russia exploded. Oh, and what's also nice is that they got a $9.1 billion loan from Russia to build a nuclear power plant. And while it wasn't a huge surprise that it secured a $10 billion loan from its long-standing ally Qatar, it was a big surprise that Erdogan would also get a $5 billion investment from Qatar's rival Saudi Arabia. Finally, the United Arab Emirates, which allegedly funded the 2016 attempt to overthrow Erdogan's government are now also back in Turkey's good graces after signing a 4.9 billion currency swap deal. So yeah, these are some pretty unorthodox strategies employed by Mr. Erdogan to save the Turkish lira. First, he started the process of lirarization, and second, while he said, "Onların dolarları varsa bizim Allahımız var." He was at the same time asking his former rivals to get the dollars he needed to prop up the lira without needing to raise interest rates. But yeah, it seemed to have worked, at least for now. It buys the country time to reduce its energy dependence and if it is actually able to do that, it might even reduce its dependence on former rivals in the long run. However, that is pretty optimistic because as one of Turkey's most famous economists has noted, Turkey has a serious productivity problem because its government has compromised the independence of key institutions and failed to encourage the development of new thought and technologies. And if it indeed fails to develop a sustainable economy, borrowing from its rivals might come back to haunt it. After all, Lebanon's rulers had tried the same strategy of borrowing from rivaling Middle Eastern states and their economy collapsed in part because one of its backers, Saudi Arabia, wasn't happy with its politics. So what do you think? Was this a smart move by Erdogan or did he basically sell his country to buy votes for the upcoming election? Let me know in the comments or in more detail on the Money & Macro Discord server for patrons and members. And if you want a more in-depth look at Turkey's economic problem, check out my previous video on the subject over here or alternatively this video about why Russia is making more money than ever. Lirarization. Li Lirarization. Li Lirarization. Lirarization.